Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the modern day scenario in the House of Glass. Written by Gail Clendenin, the scenario was published in Bayat al-Azif issue 3 in 2020, playable for both Call of Cthulhu 7th edition and Gumshoe's Trail of Cthulhu role-playing games. Coming in at 21 pages, including maps and handouts, the scenario was easily playable in a single session. I believe it took our group about four hours in order to complete the whole thing. The setting is interesting, the whole adventure taking place within a giant conservatory building. And while art and artists are frequently the centerpieces for mythos adventures, uh, normally stone sculptures or strange and unusual paintings, this one adds a unique flavor to that by focusing on glass blowing. Specifically, the glassblowing style of Dale Chihuly, which, come on, you gotta admit, these things look like writhing tentacles from yogg Sothoth's nightmares. If you're unfamiliar with many of the tools and terms and techniques in the art of glassblowing, the scenario provides a crash course cheat sheet to help you through the basics. Which is pretty nice, because it saves you the effort of having to look all that stuff up yourself. Which is why my internet search history includes terms such as rod, paddle, blow, glory hole, and hot box. At least that's the excuse I tell people as to why that stuff is in my search history. If used as a one-shot adventure, the scenario provides us with six pre-generated characters for both Call of Cthulhu or Trail of Cthulhu formats, which is really cool that they provided us with both. I was fortunate enough to have been run through this adventure by the author, Gail Clendenin. Uh, regular viewers might recognize her name as the Voice of Mother in my Chariot of the Gods review. So what I'm going to do is look over this adventure, offer my criticisms, my tips, and a few little ideas for any game masters that might want to try running this for their own group. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Otherwise, you'll ruin the surprise and earn Jack's personal disappointment. He's right, because I am watching you. Right now. And I know that your internet search history is already pretty interesting. And don't act like you don't know what I'm referring to. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. The scenario takes place in the fictitious Pierce Botanical Conservatory, which is not so loosely based off of the very real Franklin Park and Jewel Box Conservatories. The Pierce is hosting a special exhibit for the famed glassblowing artist Galen Tissely. The scenario takes place well before this event opens, and the player characters have arrived to either assist with the setup of the event, or as VIP donors are given exclusive and early access to the exhibit as well as getting to meet the artist himself. While all the pre-generated characters are given specific reasons while they're at the event this evening, some groups prefer making their own characters for adventures, which is perfectly fine. So the module gives us uh, several suggestions as to why player characters might be attending this event, which I always do appreciated provided ideas as how to work in non-pre-generated characters into an adventure. Now the backstory going on is that Galen Tisley has discovered uh, several ancient glassblowing techniques from a copy of the Book of Eben, and from them he's learned of a special powder that when he's added it to the molten glass uh, gives it a unique ultraviolet glow. What exactly is an ultraviolet hue? Like, what does that even mean? It's like a purple coloring, I think. Uh, the module describes it as a very rich violet. No, that'd just be a cool shade of violet. Technically, ultraviolet is invisible to us, but most people think about black lights whenever they think about them. Huh. Okay, well, maybe the glass does have a very rich violet hue to it. However, because this is a magical sort of powder, it also acts like a black light was shining through it. So kind of giving all the colors that kind of a good pop, sort of a, a light that doesn't have a light, like things around it seem to glow. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Make the whole exhibit look like the set of Avatar. Okay, so following this idea, why I wasn't able to find any pictures of Chihuly glass that was being UV responsive, a few glass artists out there, uh, such as Susan Leibel, do make UV glass sculptures. So I think it'd be kind of a cool interpretation of this adventure if Game Masters could have it where their glass acts like it's under a UV light, or is emitting some sort of UV light, and it kind of adds that unearthly effect to everything, you know. Maybe you could have that light brighten as the adventure goes on, and the, the mythos starts becoming more powerful and things start getting weirder, but uh, we'll get to that part in just a bit. 
Anyway, Galen Tisley has gone completely insane from breathing in this powder that he's been putting inside the furnace, and he's already killed his assistant and is toiling away at making living glass sculptures that are made out of this mythos-infused glass. Meanwhile, the player characters are going to arrive at this special after-hours event, and there they're going to mingle in the lobby, uh, maybe get to meet one another if the characters don't know each other yet, as well as get to meet the curator, Hayumi Ono. Now, because this is an event where the press and notable donors have been invited to it, I suggest that you add something, like maybe a catered dinner, just some sort of fancy spread, you know, with little sandwiches and maybe glasses of champagne. They could even make comments about how normally food ain't allowed in this place, but for you guys, for tonight, we're going to make an exception. The players are given a few handouts, one about the exhibit itself and a magazine interview that Tisley did, and in it he mentions Hyperborea and his reading of Eben and the special glass that he's now making. After a bit, the curator leaves to go ahead and fetch Tisley, who still hasn't arrived at this event, but everybody can clearly see him through the glass walls into the courtyard where he's working in the hot shop. After 20 more minutes, she never returns, and Tisley's no longer visible through the courtyard wall, so nobody knows where anybody is. So, uh, should we keep waiting and maybe go through this place and find her? Maybe meet this oddest guy that we came all this way to meet? Anybody got a phone number? Maybe we could just call her and find out what the holdup is. If the investigators decide to go look for her, they can go through either the mountain or the tropical biomes. You can describe the scenery here, mention the glass sculptures that are already in place. Then, once they reach the desert biome, they're going to discover the body of a worker who fell off of his ladder when he was startled by one of these glass walkers. It's really at this point that the adventure actually begins. Uh, if the player characters decide to call an ambulance on their phone, they're going to get through, but shortly after that, the glass face of their smartphone is going to crack and cut their cheek. Or if they try to call Ono, then they're going to receive a, a frantic connection from her as she's being chased by the glass walkers in whichever biome that the player characters didn't use to get through to the desert one. After that, all their cell phones are going to start cutting them and start working whenever they try to use them. Now what's happening here is as Tisley is working, the magical properties of this powder has created several effects in the area. First, all the glass in the area begins acting strangely. It begins warping and melting, and being that everybody's inside of a giant glass building, this makes all the doors much more difficult to open, and the entrance to the building is now completely stuck, trapping all the investigators inside the conservatory until the adventure is done. Next, characters that are looking through glass are going to see several things that are not there. Either weird delusions of monsters, or they're going to see things moving that really aren't moving, or they might see scenes that took place in the past, you know, different things like that. The glass also starts having an, uh, a violet tint to it, so everything around them is going to start glowing this sort of faint violet color. The glass is also now indestructible, meaning that the player characters are going to be completely unable to break any windows. Uh, instead, if they try to smash one of the windows, it, it might ripple like some sort of jelly, or it might cut them if they try to punch their way through it, or whatever the game master likes, in order to kind of stress that this glass is not acting normal. And as the adventure goes on, and the, the mythos power starts growing and growing, all of these effects are going to start having you know, much more of a dramatic effect. So game masters are kind of want to start this off a little bit slow, that way they've got room to sort of work their way up as the adventure is keeping going forward. Now, with smartphones and the like, instead of just the, the glass face of your smartphone, you know, cutting their cheek if they're trying to make a phone call, uh, one suggestion that I have is, is mix it up. Maybe you could have it where the glass face starts uh, heating up and it burns the player character's cheek for, you know, the same amount of damage, or maybe the glass face just begins warping and bending, and that actually ends up like crushing and breaking the phone itself because the, the glass face is kind of twisting the entire thing around, maybe into some sort of uh, spiral or curve or something like that. Or if the player characters look at the face of their smartphone, the, uh, the delusional aspect of it, uh, maybe they're going to see some sort of screaming face looking back at them or some sort of alien scene or something like that because they're seeing something through the glass that really isn't there. Eventually, the PCs are going to encounter the glass walkers. These are the now living sculptures that Tisley has made with his mythos-infused glass, which is partially molten, causing burn damage to anybody that touches one. Some of the bigger ones can actually spit molten glass, which is particularly nasty. Hey guys, if we break these things, we ain't gotta pay for them, right? Because those sculptures are like super expensive. 
Now, one hint that's given as far as the glass walker's weaknesses and how to defeat them is that they're going to see a walker that you know falls off a wall or the ceiling into a pool of water, and the instant cooling that the water has uh, it causes the glass to just suddenly shatter and explode, killing the glass walker. Personally, I suggest that keepers maybe hold off on this hint a little bit. See if the player characters come up with that on their own once they see that these are uh, kind of molten glass that's moving around, because maybe they'll think of doing that themselves. And once they realize that they can do that, then they can be pretty proud that they came up with a solution. But if they don't come up with that quickly enough, or if they don't come up with it all, go ahead and give them that hint in order to help them along. But I suggest that you hold back on it a little bit just to see what your players come up with on their own, because sometimes they'll surprise you. Holy crap, guys, these things pop when you put them in water. Quick, somebody find me a water hose. There are several water spigots and five gallon buckets throughout this entire place. Unfortunately, the keeper map doesn't mark the locations down, so go ahead and note all that on your keeper map before you start the game. Also, I don't think there's enough spigots in this place, especially in the tropical biome where you're going to need a lot more water because of the plants in there, so you might want to add a few extra spigots, but not necessarily any more buckets than what the module says. Buckets of water? Are you freaking kidding me? No way. I am calling it an airstrike, and I am setting the sprinkler systems off. The module does account for this. However, an activated sprinkler system is only going to affect the, the specific biome or the specific room that that sprinkler has been activated in. It's not going to activate across the entire building itself. Also, the ceilings are tall enough to, uh, to accommodate that there's tr full-size trees growing inside this place, so uh, the mountain biome is probably the only one that the player characters can get an easier access to the sprinkler heads if they want to set them off. However, one other thing that I just want to mention here is how sprinkler heads actually work. In the middle of them is a glass tube that's filled with fluid, usually in this case red. In the presence of heat, that fluid expands, which shatters the glass plug, and allows the water to shoot out and douse whatever the fire is. Now, because the magical effects of the nearby glass all being indestructible because of you know, what the module is about, keepers don't have to allow for the old hold a lighter under it and set off the sprinkler system trick to work. Also, and just because I'm giving sprinkler facts now, despite what movies tell you, the only sprinkler that's actually going to go off if you do something like you know the old lighter under it trick is going to be the specific sprinkler head that was set off. It's not going to set all the ones off in the room, though it might set off alarm once a sensor notices that the water pressure starts changing. And in a hundred year old system, like the module says that this place has, the water that comes out of these things is probably going to be super nasty and black, and it's going to smell like death itself. Do you uh, care to explain how it is you know so much about sprinkler systems? Not confessing that one on the internet, dude. No way. Now, clever players, they might be able to still access the water that's inside the sprinkler system if the game master doesn't allow the uh, glass plugs to break. Uh, maybe they could use the tools that that fallen workman had in order to uh, uncouple or maybe break the pipes for the whole sprinkler system, and that could allow the water to gush forth and kind of allow the player characters to sort of problem solve, you know, different ways of getting to that water that's now trapped inside that sprinkler system that they just can't seem to activate all the normal ways. Now, one thing that was really fun when we played this adventure uh, was our characters, you know, once they discovered the glass walkers, we then tried to run out to the lobby in order to get outside the building. But once we got closer through the glass doors to the building, we, you know, we saw these monsters through them with these, you know, glowing eyes, and they're uh, approaching the building, and they're kind of banging on the doors. Uh, so we freaked out. We thought some sort of monsters were getting inside. So, you know, our characters, you know, we slid up to the door, and we quickly locked them to keep these monsters from getting inside. Now, in truth, those are really just the cops and the ambulance people that we had called to come here, and they weren't able to get inside the building because of these enchanted doors, so they were banging on the doors, and we completely were under the delusion that there were monsters, so you know, we just ran up and locked the doors because we were completely terrified of these things. Now, one thing that I do find really cool about this adventure is that this scenario provides us with a list of effects that player characters experiencing a bout of madness might have, which, you know, is tailored to this specific scenario, and I think that is great. I wish more scenarios out there did custom Customized bouts of madness tables, uh, rather than just leaving it up to the keepers to use the generic one that's inside the keeper guide, this makes it feel a lot more personal for the adventure. 
Now, stopping the threat here is pretty simple to do. I think it's a little too simple if you ask me. Uh, all you have to do is shut down the glass furnace. And once the furnace starts cooling, all the monsters around the place are going to cool down and they're going to freeze in place and the uh, glow is going to leave from the walls and the adventure is going to be done because we can now open the doors and get out of here. So my suggestion here, in order to uh, maybe add another layer to this or uh, kind of make it just a little bit more complicated to solve, is if you use Tisley's notes, which can be found inside of his bag. Here we learn about the magic powder that he's been adding to the glass. Now, this serves as a cool means for the characters, and therefore the players, to learn why all this stuff is going on. But my idea here is to go ahead and add some sort of note to the translation here, a mixture of some sort of antidote or something to this magic powder that Tisley has made, and you could throw this antidote powder or a kind of combination of herbs inside the furnace, and that would completely cancel and negate the magical effects of the magical powder. Now, the ingredients to this, you could have be uh, different herbs, and as the player characters are going through the, the list of herbs, they might recognize them uh, either through a botany or a natural world's role, or maybe if they're just authorities on everything that's in the conservatory, all the herbs are growing inside the conservatory throughout all the different biomes here. So now the player characters are running around the conservatory, going through all the different biomes, you know, searching through the plants, trying to find these specific herbs, then bringing all those back to the courtyard, you know, mixing them up in some sort of special mixture, you know, tossing them in the furnace and canceling the magic out altogether. Oh, well, I can do one better than that. What you do is you have one of those herbs that's on that list not be growing anywhere inside the conservatory. So now the player characters are panicking, going, oh my god, we don't have all the ingredients. But then maybe they could remember that that herb that they want was on that table when they had that big cated dinner if you decided to add that. So now the player characters, they got to run all the way back around to the lobby where there was rosemary or whatever that ingredient is. Now that would be pretty fun. Just an idea if game masters might want to add another layer of complexity to this adventure. Now, another idea that I have is while the glass walls inside the conservatory and this building are completely impenetrable uh, as the whole time that the furnace is going, maybe you could have it where the glass monsters can actually pass through this glass, like it's some sort of membrane to them. They sort of uh, melt into it and emerge out the other side. And that might be a good possibility of something you might want to consider if the investigators maybe just uh, barricade them themselves up inside of a room and they're trying to wait for help to arrive, you know, just have the monsters start coming through the walls at them. Once the furnace is stopped and the magic fades, the adventure is done. How the player characters explain this entire story to the authorities, uh, especially those of us that might have been seen clearly locking the doors, the cops and the ambulance guys arrive, that is completely up to them. Oh, that, um... That Tisley dude, you know, he added a bunch of drugs to that furnace, and we breathed that stuff in, and we were tripping balls. I mean, it looked like the walls were breathing, looked like those sculptures are chasing us. It was nuts. Anyway, that Tisley dude, he is crazy. He already killed this woman. I mean, artists, am I right? Overall, I really did enjoy this adventure. I enjoyed the unique setting of going ahead and putting this inside of a conservatory and the aspect of using a blown glass as the focus because I can't remember any adventure I've ever seen that's ever done that before. So this is an original adventure. It's kind of nice to do something that's very different than everything else out there. And we had a lot of fun playing with it. It hits the ground running because once the adventure starts, it just starts and the player characters are now trapped inside this place and it goes straight to the action. And it makes it a really good single session adventure because it doesn't allow a lot of room for the player characters to uh, to wander around and get lost and soak up a lot of time. They are here, the adventure is here, and until they stop whatever the threat is, they're not going to be able to get out of here. My only real criticism of it is the lack of investigation that we have, where the characters might have to uncover the solution to their problem by reading the clues and figuring out what the answer is. Now, it still did take us a while in order to figure out what the solution to it was, you know, as we uh, ran from the courtyard all the way back to the foyer as we're getting chased by monsters, and then we thought there were monsters outside, so we locked the door and then fought our way to get back to the courtyard, and finally at that point is when we decided to shut down the furnace. So it wasn't like we just walked in and shut it off and we're done in only three minutes, but some player characters out there might do that, and it might end the game a little bit earlier than game masters might want. And while adding a portion, you know, where the player characters have to discover the solution or to stop this problem, 
problem through investigation and research, such as combining the herbs, which is one idea that I had, it is going to add to the time that this, this adventure might take. So this adventure might end up taking you more than a single session if you do that. So the cost is that it lengthens playtime, but I think it enhances the adventure. So definitely use this at your own risk. You can find the adventure on DriveThruRPG. I've got links below. I suggest that you check it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or Game Master Toolbox, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, if Call of Cthulhu has taught me anything, it's that if I ever get invited to some sort of premier art gallery or art exhibit, I'm going to tell them that I'm out of town. Those things are far too dangerous.